This week's blog post is the third in my sculpture synopsis series. It covers Greek classical sculpture. For more on the why and how of the sculpture synopsis series, see the first post in this series. The series is also available as a playlist on my YouTube channel. So these are three characteristic examples of classical Greek sculpture. The major difference between the archaic period, which I talked about last week, and the classical period is that in the classical period, the human body is treated as an organic whole, not a collection of well-studied parts. From the early classical period, we have the Zeus of Artemisium, around 460 BC. From the high classical period, Phidias' Parthenon pedimental sculptures from the 430s BC. And from the late classical period, Lysippus' Apoxiomenos, or Scraper, around 330 BC. These are the dates and the breakdown of the classical period. Early classical runs about 490 to 450. High classical is about 450 to 404 when the Peloponnesian War ended. And late classical is about 404 to 323 when Alexander the Great died. If you want, you can pause and read the other achievements as well. Location. These are the Greek-speaking areas during the Peloponnesian War which was fought 431 to 404 BC. Athens and her allies are in red. Sparta and her allies are in blue. Uh, the others were not actually participating. And this is a map of the territory that Alexander the Great marched through. It's called his empire, even though he didn't live long enough to actually organize it into anything like an empire. Media. There is stone, often marble. Originally, it would have been brightly painted. If you look at last week's post, you can see a reconstructed version of the Peplos Kore that shows the bright colors that they used. Also in this period, we start seeing life-size figures of bronze. Bronze sculptures are made based on clay models, which allows more scope for changing your mind about major or minor details. So it's an important technical in innovation. The subjects of sculpture during the classical period are mythological figures and stories. There are some portraits, including political figures, and a few victorious athletes. Dominant ideas. Men are fascinating. They are worthy of study and accurate representation. Life on Earth is important. And in philosophy, there is a, an amazing range of ideas. The period begins with philosophers searching for the one in the many Heraclitus, who flourished around 500 BC, said the universe is just something that's in constant change. Parmenides said the universe is absolutely changeless. Pluralists came along and said the universe is made up of many distinct elements that combine randomly. Moving from there to epistemology, philosophers said the universe is unknowable. Those were the skeptics. So man must do whatever works. Those are the sophists. Or man must discover how he gains knowledge so that he can determine what ethical behavior actually is. That's Socrates. Or true knowledge is only possible to philosopher kings. That's Plato. By 330 BC, we have Aristotle saying that man can learn about the world by observation and logic. That is the very first time that was expressed. Let's look at the style. Classical sculptures show mature, idealized figures in a wide variety of poses, with anatomy accurately portrayed at rest and in motion. Early classical is marked by serious expressions and grand and dignified poses. High classical adds what's called wet drapery. It's fabric that clings to the shapes beneath, revealing and emphasizing them, as in the figures in the center. And late classical has new poses and more realistic features which I'll talk about in this slide. Okay, innovations during the classical period. These are the things that I mentioned in Innovators in Sculpture. Contraposto is developed during the early classical period. It means that in a standing or walking figure, parts of the body will shift to balance opposing forces. So if, if you put your weight on one foot, the rest of your body is going to adjust to keep you balanced. The example is Polyclitus' spear bearer. Another innovation during the classical period is figures that don't look like they were carved out of a single upright block of stone. They turn on their axis, they lean to one side, they enclose space by holding their arms in front of them. 
uh, Hermes with infant Dionysus, the second from the left, is an example of that. Another innovation in this period is the portrayal of emotion by means of facial expression rather than just by gesture. I've given you Scopus's pothos, longing, as an example. And also during the classical period, there is an interest in figures that are realistic rather than idealized. This is a portrait of Aristotle at the upper right. It's the earliest really realistic looking portrait that we've got. Okay, moving on to the big names in art. And there are several in this period, but we only have later copies of their works. We don't have their original works. First among them is Polycletus. That's an example of his on the left. The spear bearer, aside from being a great example of contraposto, embodies Polycletus's system of ideal, mathematically determined proportions. He thought that the fingers should have a certain proportion to the palm of the hand, and the hand as a whole should have a certain proportion to the arm going up to the elbow, and so on and so on. The second famous name is Phidias, who died in 432 BC. He is the most famous artist of the Greek and Roman world. He was responsible for the design of the early classical sculptures on the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, and also for the high classical sculptures of the Parthenon in Athens. And those two projects were such major long-term projects that there were many, many sculptors in Greece who worked on them and were influenced by Phidias' style. Third famous artist, Lysippus, He's active in the mid and late 4th century BC. I mentioned him as one of the innovators in pose. Uh, Praxiteles, I also mentioned under innovations, he's the one who is famous for having figures that lean sideways, like the Hermes, second from the left. Praxiteles' Aphrodite of Knidos is the first freestanding female nude in Greek art. Usually only men were shown nude, and nude until the 4th century. And finally, among big names in art, Scopus, who was also active in the 4th century BC. Scopus is famous for first showing emotions via facial expression. And again, I've discussed that in her innovations above. One more example of classical sculpture. The Temple of Aphia at Aegina has a pediment at one end that was done during the Archaic period. That's the figure at the top right. And the anatomy looks okay. It still has the archaic smile, which is characteristic of that period of Greek sculpture. The other end of the temple was done 10 years later, and it is in early classical style. And you can see that the warrior, these are both warriors who are dying. This one has a, a hole for a spear in the middle of his chest, and this one is just clearly collapsing. But the one on the upper right looks like he could be at a banquet, if you didn't realize that was a hole for a spear. And the other one is clearly dying from the way that his head is bowed, to the way his arm is helping push himself up, and this arm is already kind of falling limp on his shield. So this is a, a great summary of the contrast between archaic and classical. If you want to see examples of original Greek sculptures, you would go to the National Museum in Athens, the Archaeological Museum in Delphi, and the Archaeological Museum in Olympia, in the southern part of Greece. The Parthenon sculptures, many of them are in the British Museum. Uh, some of them are in the Acropolis Museum in Athens as well. If you want to see Roman copies of classical works, they are all over the place, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum, the Louvre, the Vatican, and the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Further reading, John Boardman wrote Greek Sculpture of the Classical Period, which is one of the basic textbooks. Richter's Handbook of Greek Art is a survey that's widely used in courses on Greek art. You can see Innovators in Sculpture, chapters 3, 4, and 5, and 6. And just for fun, Mary Renault's Alexander the Great Trilogy, which includes Fire from Heaven, The Persian Boy, and Funeral Games. Renault was a really good historical novelist, and she often wrote about ancient Greece. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantiWriter.com. 
As always, thank you for listening.